For this video, we are going to discuss the crimes of piracy and mutiny in the RPC. We also have piracy in PD-532, qualified piracy in the RPC and in PD-532, qualified mutiny in the RPC, the anti-hijacking law, and when piracy or hijacking is considered as terrorism in Republic Act 9372. Let's start with Article 122. Piracy in general and mutiny on the high seas or in Philippine waters. The penalty of reclusion perpetua shall be inflicted upon any person who on the high seas or in Philippine waters shall attack or seize a vessel or not being a member of its complement nor a passenger shall seize the whole or part of the cargo of said vessel its equipment or personal belongings of its complement or passengers. The same penalty shall be inflicted in case of mutiny on the high seas or in Philippine waters. So this provision has been amended by Section 3 of Republic Act 7659 because before the enactment of RA 7659, piracy in Article 122 referred only to piracy in the high seas but uh, with the enactment of RA 7659 piracy in article 122 now includes piracy in Philippine waters or committed in Philippine waters let's go to article 123 on qualified piracy The penalty of reclusion perpetua to death shall be imposed upon those who commit any of the crimes referred to in the preceding article under any of the following circumstances. Number one, whenever they have seized a vessel by boarding or firing upon the same. Number two, whenever the pirates have abandoned their victims without means of saving themselves or number three, whenever the crime is accompanied by murder homicide, physical injuries, or rape. In the same manner, this provision has also been amended by Section 3 of the said law, no, RA 7659. Let's go now to the definition of piracy under PD 532. Section 2D of the said law provides that piracy is any attack upon or seizure of any vessel or the taking away of the whole or part thereof or its cargo equipment or personal belongings of its complement or passengers irrespective of the value thereof by means of violence against or intimidation of persons or force upon things committed by any person including a passenger or member of the complement of the said vessel in philippine waters shall be considered as piracy the offenders shall be considered as pirates and punished as herein after provided. Now let's go to Section 3A, Qualified Piracy under PD 532. The penalty of reclusion temporal in its medium and maximum period shall be imposed. If physical injuries or other crimes are committed as a result or on the occasion thereof, the penalty of reclusion perpetua shall be imposed. If rape, murder, or homicide is committed as a result or on the occasion of piracy or when the offenders abandon the victims without means of saving themselves or when the seizure is accompanied by firing upon or boarding a vessel, the mandatory penalty of death shall be imposed. How do we define piracy? There can be no better definition than to take it from the provision itself. So to repeat, piracy is a crime committed by any person who on the high seas or in Philippine waters shall attack or seize a vessel or not being a member of its complement nor a passenger shall seize the whole or part of the cargo of said vessel, its equipment or personal belongings of its complement or passengers. The essence of piracy is robbery on the high seas or in Philippine waters committed against the vessel, its cargo, its equipment, or the personal belongings of its complement or its passengers. 
with intent to gain and by means of violence or intimidation of persons or force upon things. On the other hand, mutiny, which is also defined or mentioned in Article 122, is the unlawful resistance to a superior officer or the raising of commotions and disturbances on board a ship against the authority of its commander. Intent to gain is essential in the crime of piracy, while the offenders in mutiny may only intend to ignore the ship's officers or they may be prompted by a desire to commit plunder. Now let's go to the meaning of the term Philippine waters. Philippine waters shall refer to all bodies of water, such as but not limited to seas, gulfs, bays around, between, and connecting each of the islands of the Philippine archipelago, irrespective of its depth, breadth, length, or dimension, and all other waters belonging to the Philippines by historic or legal title, including the territorial sea, the seabed, the insular shelves, and other submarine areas over which the Philippines has sovereignty or jurisdiction. So, the definition of Philippine waters is taken from the provision in Section 2A of PD 532. Now, there is no corresponding definition of Philippine waters in the RPC, so I will take it to mean that the definition here of Philippine waters in PD 532 should also apply to the meaning of the term Philippine waters in Articles 122 and 123. What does the term high seas mean? Under Article 86 of the UN Convention of the Law on the Sea to which the Philippines is a signatory, and by being a signatory, that treaty, the UNCLOS, already forms part of the law of our land. High seas refer to all parts of the sea that are not included in the exclusive economic zone, in the territorial sea, or in the internal waters of a state, or in the archipelagic waters of an archipelagic state. We are an archipelagic state because we are a state comprising of islands. In fact, we, are, we have 7,107 islands at the most. What about the term vessel? Vessel is any vessel or watercraft used for transport of passengers and cargo from one place to another through Philippine waters, but this should also include the high seas no? because there is no definition of the term vessel in Article 122. So by necessary implication, the term vessel should have one and the same meaning for both Section 2B in PD 532 and in Article 122 of the Revised Penal Code. Vessel shall include all kinds and types of vessels or boats used in fishing. So, yung bangka kasali na doon no, sa term na vessel. Now, you might ask, Fiscal, saan ba yung high seas or paano ba natin malalaman kung nasa high seas na tayo? As you can see in this picture, the Philippine archipelago is surrounded by several imaginary lines. The, the first line, colored yellow, is the baseline. The second line, colored blue, is the territorial sea. The third line, colored pink, is the contiguous zone. The fourth line, colored white, is the EEZ or the exclusive economic zone. Then we have two dotted lines, the juridical continental shelf and the extended continental shelf. Now, the first question to ask is, why do we have to have a baseline? Under the UN Convention of the Law on the Sea, we have to draw a baseline because it is from the baseline that we are able to determine the extent of our territorial sea, the extent of our contiguous zone, the extent of our EEZ and continental shelf. Now, how do we determine the baseline? The baseline is determined by connecting the outermost points of the outermost islands of the Philippine archipelago, as you can see in this picture. And from that baseline, we can now determine the extent of the territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles from the baseline. 
the contiguous zone, which is 24 nautical miles from the same baseline, and the EEZ or the continental shelf, which is 200 nautical miles from that same baseline also. Now, why are these important? This is important because within, the ter within our territorial sea and in our archipelagic waters, it is in these waters that the Philippines has full sovereignty or exclusive sovereignty, meaning we have full ownership over these waters. Beyond the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and the EEZ, we do not anymore have or we do not anymore exercise exclusive sovereignty over these waters. But at the very least, we exercise sovereign rights because, for example, in the contiguous zone, a state may exercise certain protective jurisdiction like customs enforcement, fiscal, immigration, and sanitary rules. Meanwhile, in the EEZ, a state has what? Exclusive rights to explore, exploit, conserve, and manage natural resources as well as build artificial islands, carry out environmental protection, and conduct marine scientific research. This is all based on the UN Convention of the Law on the Sea to which the Philippines is a signatory. And by being a signatory, this now forms part of the law of our land. So, to repeat, within the territorial sea and in our archipelagic waters, we exercise full sovereignty. Beyond the territorial sea, we only have sovereign rights, like what I described a while ago. Now, to answer the first question I posed a while ago, saan ba yung high seas? After the EEZ, no, beyond the 200 nautical miles from the baseline, yun na yung high seas na sinasabi natin. The next question to ask is, how do we know that the vessel is still in Philippine waters? The answer is simple. Philippine waters include our archipelagic waters, the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and the exclusive economic zone. Like what I said, beyond the exclusive economic zone, yun na yun ang high seas. So for purposes of application of PD-532, PD-532 only applies up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline and of course, to include our archipelagic waters and our territorial sea. Now, this leads me to discuss to you the difference between sovereignty and sovereign rights. Sovereignty is like full ownership of property with all the rights it implies, including the right to destroy it. Sovereignty applies to the Philippines' landmass and its 12 nautical mile territorial sea. So, like what I said a while ago, we exercise full ownership over our territorial sea as well as our archipelagic waters. Sovereign rights, on the other hand, function like a use of rock or a right to use and enjoy property. It allows the Philippines to exclusively fish and enjoy marine resources such as oil and natural gas in its 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone in the West Philippine Sea. Under international law, the Philippines has sovereignty over its territorial sea and jurisdiction over its exclusive economic zone, meaning beyond 12 nautical miles up to 200 nautical miles. International law does not recognize sovereignty beyond the 12 nautical mile territorial sea. Let's now go to the distinction between piracy as defined and penalized in the Revised Penal Code and piracy as defined and penalized in PD-532. In the RPC, there are two ways by which piracy can be committed. The first way is when the purpose of the offender is to attack or seize the vessel itself. Because if the purpose or the criminal intent of the offender is to seize the vessel itself, then the offender here can be any person. By any person, I mean to say a person outside of the vessel or it can also mean a member of the complement or a passenger. 
for as long as the criminal intent or the criminal purpose is to attack or seize the vessel itself. But if the purpose of the offender is not to attack or seize the vessel itself but only to seize inside the vessel the whole or part of its cargo, its equipment, or the personal belongings of its passengers or members of its complement, then the offender here cannot be any person. The offender here must not be a member of the complement or a passenger. So, the offender here should be a person from outside of the vessel because if the offender here is a passenger, a co-passenger for example, or a member of the complement or a crew member, then the crime is no longer piracy but either robbery or theft. That is the point there. Now, in the crime punished as piracy in PD 532, take note that there is no more distinction. Whether the overt act is an attack or seizure of a vessel, or only to seize in the vessel the whole or part of its cargo, equipment or personal belongings of the passengers or the members of its complement, the offender here can be any person. So, a member of the complement, a passenger or a person from outside the vessel can be liable under PD 532. And like what I said, there is no more distinction as to the purpose. Okay, Whether the purpose is to seize the vessel or its cargo, its belonging, the, the, the equipment or the belongings of the passengers or members of the complement, the crime is piracy, plain and simple. Okay, but not so in the revised penal code. So take note of this principal distinction. Another distinction between the RPC and PD 532 is that in the RPC, the situs of the piracy is either in the high seas or in Philippine waters, meaning the revised penal code or the piracy as punished in the revised penal code applies to vessels in the high seas or vessels in Philippine waters. But in PD 532, the situs is in Philippine waters only. In the RPC, the crime becomes qualified piracy if the piracy is committed under any of the following circumstances. Number one, whenever they have seized a vessel by boarding or firing upon the same. Whenever the pirates, number two, have abandoned their victims without means of saving themselves. Or number three, whenever the crime is accompanied by murder, homicide, physical injuries, or rape. In PD 532, the circumstances that make for qualified piracy in Article 123 are also the same circumstances as found in Section 3A of PD 532. So there is no distinction here, no? Uh, qualified, qualified piracy in the RPC and qualified piracy in PD 532 has the same meaning or definition. Now, in the RPC, there is no more distinction between simple piracy in Article 122 and qualified piracy in Article 123. Why? Because with the abolition of the death penalty by Republic Act 9346, both now carry the same penalty of reclusion perpetua. Why do I say this? The penalty in Article 122 for simple piracy is reclusion perpetua. Whereas originally, or prior to the abolition of the death penalty, the penalty for qualified piracy in Article 123 as amended by Section 3 of Republic Act 7659, the penalty is reclusion perpetua to death. But with the abolition of the death penalty, the penalty for qualified piracy is or only carries now reclusion perpetua. So both simple piracy and qualified piracy now carry the same penalty of reclusion perpetua. In PD 532, on the other hand, the penalty for simple piracy is reclusion temporal, medium, and maximum. Whereas the penalty for qualified piracy in PD 532 is reclusion perpetua. Although originally, prior to the 
abolition of the death penalty, the penalty for qualified piracy in PD 532 is death. No, if the um, if the piracy is uh, is accompanied by murder or rape or homicide, the penalty is death. If the piracy is accompanied by physical injuries, the penalty is reclusion perpetua. That is the penalty for qualified piracy in PD 532. But like what I said. Because the death penalty has been abolished, meaning to say there is no more death penalty, the penalty now for qualified piracy in PD 532 is reclusion perpetua. With respect to abettors in piracy, a distinction has to be made between abettors in piracy in the revised penal code and abettors in piracy in PD 532. Abettors in piracy in the revised penal code are punished as either accomplices in Article 18 or as accessories in Article 19. Whereas abettors in piracy in PD 532 are all treated as accomplices. Even if such an abettor or such abettor acted merely as an accessory. Why is this? Let me read to you the specific provision itself. Any person who knowingly and in any manner aids or protects pirates such as giving them information about the movement of police or acquires or receives property taken by such pirates or in any manner derives any benefit therefrom, or any person who directly or indirectly abets piracy shall be considered as an accomplice of the principal offenders. To repeat, there is no distinction whether you cooperate in the execution of the offense by previous or simultaneous acts, meaning you are, you are an accomplice, or you merely take part subsequent to its commission, meaning you are an accessory. Whether you acted merely as an accomplice or as an accessory, you are punished as an accomplice in PD 532. There is no accessory in PD 532. Whereas in the RPC, you are either punished as, or abettors are either punished as accomplices or accessories. Next question. Is there qualified mutiny in Article 123? Let me again read to you Article 123. Qualified piracy. Take note. Article 123 makes specific mention only of qualified piracy. It did not specifically mention qualified mutiny. But let us examine the first paragraph of this article. The penalty of reclusion perpetua to death shall be imposed upon those who commit any of the crimes referred to in the preceding article. The phrase any of the crimes referred to in the preceding article, the preceding article here is Article 122. And you already know that Article 122 not only punishes piracy but also punishes mutiny. So the answer is yes, because the phrase any of the crimes referred to in the preceding article should also refer to mutiny. But Take note that the first circumstance, diba? there are three circumstances here. The first circumstance only applies to piracy because the offenders in mutiny, the mutineers, need not any more board or fire upon the vessel. Meaning to say, yung applicable lang na mga circumstances dito is yung circumstance number two and circumstance number three for purposes of determining whether the mutineers are guilty of qualified mutiny under Article 123. I will now discuss to you some salient points on the anti-hijacking law or Republic Act 6235. There are actually four punishable acts covered under this law. The first punishable act is when the offender compels an aircraft of Philippine registry to change course or destination or otherwise usurps or seizes control while it is in flight. The aircraft, take note, is in flight when all the exterior doors thereof are closed following embarkation until opened for disembarkation. So, even if the aircraft has not moved away, even if the aircraft is not yet in flight, for as long as the passengers, for example, have gone inside and the doors have been closed, as long as the doors have not been opened again for disembarkation, 
that aircraft is already deemed to be in flight. And then take note of the kind of aircraft involved, no? Aircraft of Philippine registry. So it could be a passenger aircraft, a cargo aircraft of public utility. It could be a, an aircraft which is privately owned or government owned for as long as the aircraft is of Philippine registry and the offender compel such aircraft to change its course or destination, for example, then the crime is already committed or violated. The second way of committing hijacking or the second punishable act is when the offender compels an aircraft of foreign registry to land in any part of the Philippine territory or when the offender usurps or seizes control of such aircraft while it is within Philippine territory. Here, there is no more requirement that the aircraft be in flight, unlike in the first punishable act. And also take note of the kind of aircraft involved. The aircraft must be of foreign registry. So if the aircraft is of foreign registry, it need not be in flight for purposes of violation under the Second Punishable Act under the Anti-Hijacking Law. Then we have the qualifying circumstances in both numbers 1 and 2, no? the first and the second Punishable Act. So the crime becomes qualified if during the commission of the hijacking, the offender either fires upon the pilot, crew member, or passenger, or the offender explodes or attempts to explode any bomb or explosive to destroy the aircraft or when the crime of hijacking is accompanied by murder, homicide, serious physical injuries, or rape. Qualified because the penalty increases when either of these circumstances are present during the commission of the hijacking. The third punishable act is the carrying or loading on board a passenger aircraft operating as a public utility in the Philippines, substances which are corrosive, flammable, explosive, or poisonous. So here, the mere carrying or loading is already punishable. Okay? So, again, take note of the kind of aircraft involved, passenger aircraft operating as a public utility. So, if you are a passenger, for example, you are not allowed to carry or load inside the aircraft any corrosive, flammable, explosive, or poisonous material or substance. Last but not the least is the shipping or loading of corrosive, flammable, explosive, or poisonous substances or materials, this time on a cargo aircraft operating as a public utility in the Philippines. So, Take note of the kind of aircraft involved, no? Cargo aircraft operating as a public utility in the Philippines. Now, how is this crime or how is this crime violated? What is penalized here is the shipping or loading of such substances which are not or which is not in accordance with ATO rules and regulations. So here it is not just the mere shipping or loading of corrosive, flammable, explosive, or poisonous substance on a cargo aircraft that makes the crime already punishable or makes the act rather already punishable. What makes the act already punishable is the carrying or shipping or loading of such substances not in accordance or not in compliance with the rules and regulations set up by the Air Transportation Office. For our last topic for this video, we will answer the question of when piracy and hijacking can be considered as an act of terrorism. To answer this question, we have to take a look at Section 3 of Republic Act 9372 or the Human Security Act of 2007. Piracy or hijacking can be considered as terrorism or as an act of terrorism if the offender commits an act that sows or creates a condition of widespread and extraordinary fear and panic among the populace in order to coerce the government to give in to an unlawful demand. Meaning to say, there must be 
the presence of two additional elements to be considered as terrorism. So, piracy can be considered as an act of terrorism or hijacking can be considered as an act of terrorism if the act sows or creates a condition of widespread and extraordinary fear among the populace and second, the purpose of creating a condition of widespread and extraordinary fear is to coerce the government to give in to an unlawful demand. So these two elements must be present because without these two elements or if only one element is present, the commission of piracy or the commission of hijacking cannot be considered as an act of terrorism. Now, take note that RA 9372 has been expressly repealed by Section 56 of Republic Act 11479 or the Anti-Terror Act of 2020. And you might ask, Fiscal, ano bang epekto ng repeal sa, ng, ng penal law? Or what is the effect of the repeal of a penal law on the accused? If the repeal is absolute or total or express, the rule requires or the rule states that the act or omission is decriminalized so that if a case is pending, it shall be dismissed. Or if the accused is already convicted or serving sentence, he shall be released. That is the effect there unless the law provides that detention is to continue. That is the effect of an express repeal of a penal law.